and welcome back to Friday Film Reviews. Um, I took a break last week. Um, I almost did do it last week, but um, I came back here to visit um, in the UK and just didn't have time really. Well, I did have time, but I didn't feel motivated to do it, so this is going to be a bumper instalment, which it is always turning out to be. The first one was epic in length. Last time I did a live stream that went on forever, so... I'm sorry, I just can't seem to keep these videos down. There will be one in the future, though, that's uh, a watchable length. This one probably won't be, but let's just crack right into it. There's 20 films to talk about that I've watched over the past two weeks. First one is Breathe In, uh, independent film from this year. Again, I'm trying to watch as many films in 2013 as I can. Um, yeah, fairly independent film. Breathe In stars um, Guy Pearce, um, and he's the um, head of a family. He's got a wife and a teenage daughter. And they live in New York, but um, not in the city, but in the state. And they bring a, uh, they have an English um, exchange student come to stay with them. Uh, this young British girl, who I believe is like 29, playing you know 17 or whatever. And Guy Pearce's character, he's like, uh, he's a musician. He teaches music in school, but what he really wants to do is be a musician full time. Um, so he's kind of stuck in a bit of a rut and. Um, you know, um, he doesn't appear unhappy, but he's definitely not happy. And uh, you can see where this movie's going as soon as you know the first ten minutes are over with, because um, you know he, he he becomes fascinated with this young English girl, and you're like, oh god, you see where this is going. And um, yeah, pretty much that that is what was was happening with um with this movie. It was about an affair that they were going to have together. What I really liked about this movie was the cinematography, which I thought was great, but also the way it dealed with Guy Pearce and this young British girl, because we've seen old movies like this before, the older man and the younger girl, and it can get like explicit, it can get graphic, it can get uncomfortable. For me, it was really treated um, with, I don't want to say respect, but with care. It was a tender look at a love affair between an older man and a younger woman, and um, not to spoil anything, but I, you know, they don't, nothing really sexual goes on, and I really liked that and I respected that, and the way it all leads to its conclusion was really told through um, silence and expression. You know, uh, this is a bit towards the end, and you know, with him and her and the way they communicate to each other just by looking at each other and then another another character just all in the eyes and I really liked that, it was a really good little film, enjoyed it um, next is Side by Side, a 2012 documentary that was um, I thought was made by Keanu Reeves but it was made by someone else but Keanu Reeves was like the the, the figurehead behind it, behind interviewing all the people for this movie uh, Side by Side deals with uh, film but it, it deals with Actual film, you know, the the movies are shot on, you know, the film strips, and it goes into how that's made, how that happens, you know, all the light that goes onto the single cell of film, and, and how it changes it, and then, you know, blah blah blah. It's an interesting. Um, uh, that's an interesting part of it, but it's, it's mainly about film versus digital, and how digital movie making has become much more prominent now, and that people are shooting with digital cameras as as opposed to shooting with film cameras. And why certain directors think this is the way forward, they think it's much easier, and then other directors who think that, you know, while it may be easier, film is more of a kind of, it's, it's more what film is about, you know, and then you get to see everyone, you know, maybe not everyone, but most of, like, the big names, you look at, like, Peter Jackson, no, actually, I don't think Peter Jackson was interviewed for this, well, you got James Cameron, Martin Scorsese, Christopher Nolan, um, you know, Christopher Nolan really champions film, he wants to shoot on film, and he's ad adamant about that. Um, but we didn't really hear that much from him, I was surprised, because if, again, he's such an advocate of filming on film. Um, we didn't hear as much from him as, say, people who were really for digital, you know. The cinematographer for a lot of Danny Boyle's movies um, was, was interviewed quite quite a lot. There's a lot of things he had to offer and bring to the table in terms of digital and that kind of thing. And it's about the advantages and the disadvantages of both formats. And yeah, again, you get to hear from so many people, so many directors and actors and producers and people who are involved. And you see Keanu Reeves sitting behind the camera talking to these people. And it's a really engaging, interesting documentary. If you're a fan of film in general, you should definitely check it out. Uh, next is All Is Bright, which is another 2013 film. Um, it's kind of builds as a comedy drama, it's more of a drama really. It's Paul Rudd, Paul Giamatti, 
uh, these two guys who have a kind of bit of history between each other. Paul Giamatti just got out of prison, and Paul Rudd is, um, you know, reluctantly bringing along Paul Giamatti to New York for a month uh, in the month of December to sell Christmas trees. And they drop they drop about three grand for Christmas trees. And they want to try and double the profit. To, uh, they want to try and double the money and make some make a profit out of it selling trees in New York and they get they find this really rough patch you know <laughs> in this middle of this like um you know this uh, residential area in New York and um you know Paul Giamatti is you know, he's just come out of prison he's on parole he's not supposed to be going into uh New York state whatsoever so they have to sneak him in and stuff and basically Paul Rudd is is now with his Paul Giamatti's wife and looking after his daughter, and his daughter thinks that he's dead, and so there's a lot of tension between the two of them, and um, it's not what you'd expect from Paul Rudd, he's definitely not how he usually is in films, and Paul Giamatti, you know, he's just great in anything, he was fantastic in this, um, we had a couple of cool side characters, but it was mainly just these two guys, I watched it with Connie and my fiance, and she, she didn't really like it because it's a very slow film, it takes a lot to get going, but for me, I appreciated that because when things did start going well for them or bad for them, there'd been that build-up and you'd lived through this, this struggle. I'm not saying it's a great film by any stretch, but I really did enjoy it. Um, yeah, and, and it was... Overall, I, I just enjoyed it. But I wouldn't say go out and see it, but it, it is a good film. Next up, Byzantium. Another 2013 film, a vampire film, starring Gemma Arterton and uh, Saoirse, Saoirse Ronan the iris a actress who i think is brilliant she's fast become one of my favorite actresses um right now she's brilliant and um she's great in this too and she plays the daughter of Gemma Arterton's character and they're both vampires and we get to see the history of their lives you know that takes back hundreds of years how they came to be and what their life is like now in present day living as vampires and there's a lot of interesting stuff in this and i really actually enjoyed it a lot um they kind of they go to this kind of seaside town um, it's like a smaller kind of version of it reminded me of Blackpool, even though it's not Blackpool, that kind of uh, thing. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this. Oh, Brighton, Brighton, I guess, something like that. But a smaller version. We had, um, oh, what's the guy's name? Um, Sam something. He was in Control. Um, he's a really good, act really good actor. I like him, and he was in it as well. Um, Johnny Lee Miller was in this and it's really like a, a proper R rated you know 18 rated vampire movie you look at it on the surface and like oh, another Twilight kind of you know movie but it is balls to the wall you know <laughs> and it's you know, proper swearing proper violence and all that kind of stuff and I really enjoyed it I thought it was a good movie um, not much more to add really but um, if you're a fan of vampire films I think you should definitely check it out it's a really good one Empire State is the next one, another 2013 film. Um, I watched this but purely because The Rock was in it and I wanted to see what it was like. I remember him tweeting that he was making a film called Empire State and I thought, just based on the, on the title it sounded pretty good, but it, it was just okay. Um, it's about the true story, of, I think it was in the 80s, the early 80s, about this guy who worked as a security officer <clears throat> in this place where there was loads of money that was being kept and he kind of got dragged into kind of stealing money uh, with his friend and you know it's a true story and I think it's like at the time, in the movie anyway, they were saying it was like the biggest heist, you know, or the big, the most amount of money that had been stolen in New York or something, and millions, and, you know, it sounds really exciting, but it's quite, it's quite a slow movie. The Rock isn't in it that much. Liam Hemsworth, uh, Chris Hemsworth's younger brother, was in this. Um, he plays Gale in the Hunger Games movies. I thought he was good in this, you know, he carried the movie well. A um, couple of cool side characters, you know, The Rock was okay for what he was in it, but overall the movie just... Um, it wasn't that engaging, you know. It wasn't bad, but it was just okay. Uh, then we watched The Hobbit: An Unexpected Journey um, in preparation for watching the new Hobbit movie, and I forgot how much I loved the first Hobbit film. In fact, I got the, um, uh, the uh, extended cut of the um, the of, of An Unexpected Journey right here. Um, <clears throat> and I, yeah, I forgot how much I loved it when I saw it in the cinema. It'd been the first time I'd seen it since then. I've had the Blu-ray since March, I think, and I still haven't watched it on Blu-ray. So it was the night before we went to see the, sec the new Hobbit film and we watched it and I was just like, oh, I love this movie, it was so great. Um, it just really surprised me, you know, because I was just not really not a big fan of Martin, the, 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 the idea of Martin Freeman being Bilbo Baggins. Um, but when I saw it, I kind of liked it and I thought all the dwarves were great. I thought, you know, Richard Armitage as Thorin was fantastic. It was great seeing Ian McKellen as Gandalf again. You know, a couple, a couple of cameos from the Lord of the Rings cast and... Yeah, I just really, really like what they did with it, and then the day after we went to see The Hobbit, The Desolation of um, Smaug. 
which was brilliant. I really, really enjoyed it. We'll do an At the Movies um, episode talking about it in depth, but um, really enjoyed the Desolation of Smaug. Um, all the stuff with the dragon was fantastic. I thought Benedict Cumberbatch was a great voice and um, a great kind of performance, I guess, as Smaug. He did like performance capture as well as doing the voice, so um, I thought that was great. All the Lake Town stuff was awesome. Luke Evans as the Bard was fantastic, brilliant. Stephen Fry as, you know, the the mayor of Lake Town, brilliant again. The el the elf, the elves, you know, um, having Legolas in it, I had no problem with it because it makes sense. You know, he would have been around then. He's from Mirkwood, but felt almost a bit like they're trying to shoehorn him in. But I did enjoy him. And some shots he kind of had his face CGI, like it looked like they kind of you know Photoshop smoothed his face, which I thought was unnecessary and just looked weird. We have um. Uh, Evangeline Lilly playing Tor Toriel, I think was her name, a new character they invented to kind of add a feminine touch to the movies, which I got no problem with. Um, it wasn't an offensive move for me to put a new character into the film, and I liked the character. I thought she was she was good. What I didn't like was how they shoehorned in a romance with her and um, Keely. I think it was Keely or Feely, uh, you know, or a potential romance they put in there. I've heard this was at the studio's request. I just thought it didn't seem to fit, I mean it fit, you know, in the terms of a big, you know, fantasy film, but in just in terms of that universe where, uh, on that world where elves and dwarves have got nothing to do with each other, they hate each other, there's this long-standing thing where they don't get on, and that's really what the whole point of Legolas and Gimli's relationship was in The Lord of the Rings, you know, particularly in the book, um, and how they kind of get over that. Uh, that barrier of elves and dwarves and really not getting on. So to me, it just felt a bit, yeah, you know. I mean, I guess they passed it off that Keeley was, you know, a bit taller than the other dwarves, a bit prettier, you know. But um, yeah, I mean, I liked what it was, you know. I liked the scene they had together and their romance, but just as an idea, it just felt a bit, you know, tacked on to me. Um, and the scene where they're kind of talking and he's in the cell it was a good scene, but it felt like it was a scene from the extended cut, you know. It just was like. What is this doing to move forward the plot? You know, but again, I liked it. It was just it's a film where I can criticize a lot, but I enjoyed everything. One thing I have to mention, and I'll mention it in the full review as well. And I've just noticed it always bugs me if my head is like too low in the frame. There we go, it's a bit better. Um, one thing that really bugged me was the barrel sequence, which I thought was great. It was you know it was CGI up the ass, but it was really fun and and just really cool. But that scene where you get a, a po point of view shot from one of the dwarves in the barrel going down the river and it's like a proper like you know head cam shot like like when you have like a, I don't know like a Discovery Channel documentary about people white water rafting and they've got like a helmet with one of those little low quality cameras on the on the, the you know, on the helmet it just, just looked like a home movie you know and it was like it really didn't fit within the whole look of this you know this gorgeous kind of filmic fantasy world and then you get this kind of camcorder shot of oh point of the view and I, and I guess the point was to, to get you right into the action but it, it took me out of it because it looked like you know something I could have filmed if I was there and I didn't like that at all and it was used three times I counted and I was just like oh my god I really didn't like that um and if you wanted to and, and if they could say well we couldn't get a film camera you know onto the uh, or a digital camera onto the, where the you know the barrel is or whatever just do it all digitally. Just you know, just just do it digitally. There's enough digital manipulation going on in these films. Just do it digitally. You don't use an actual Sony camcorder DV because it just looks, yeah. But anyway, <laughs> overall, you know, film I can criticize a lot, but I really, really loved Desolation of Smog. Next is Blue is the warmest color. I'm gonna have to do a full video on that movie. It, it really, really deserves a full video, so I'm just gonna skip that altogether. Jack the Giant Slayer, another 2013 film, basically exactly how I thought it would be, it was just okay. It was a decent ride, bit of fun, but nothing more than that. Great cast, you know, Nicholas Holt, Ewan McGregor, Ian McShane, Bill Nye, doing a great voice and, you know, um, performance, capture performance as the main um, giant in the film. He had a really weird kind of Irish accent, sounded a bit like the, um, like Davy Jones that he did in um, Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, yeah, it was fun, fun movie, but um, you know, it wasn't anything special. Serendipity, uh, which I talked about in my top five Christmas movies video, love that film. You know, it's very, very romantic and romanticized and highly Im uh, improbable, but I love it all the same. And it's just a great, you know, you got great chemistry between Kate Beckinsale and John Cusack, and um, yeah, just re really, really enjoy that film. 
um, Don John from 2013, uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's directorial debut. Um, I was really looking forward to this, it was not quite what I expected. I feel like the idea thinks it's cleverer than it is. So you got uh, John, the main character, played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who's a proper ladies' man, and you know, as he says in his narration, all he cares about is, you know, girls, you know, his mates, working out and watching porn, and he loves porn, he watches it every day. He's addicted to it, and what he finds when he sleeps with women, nothing satisfies him as much as porn does. And then he meets Scarlett Johansson, who's this kind of, you know, dream girl, and she doesn't sleep with him so quickly, and so he's really working at it. And then finally when he gets to sleep with her, it's still not as good as porn. And she finds him watching porn and she freaks out and then he's got to kind of reevaluate things. And she's got this kind of, you know, the way that he's got this kind of projection of how sex should be through porn, she's got a projection of how a relationship should be through Hollywood movies and rom-coms and things like that. And it's a pretty, you know, uh, it's a pretty basic idea. I feel like it, either Joseph Gordon-Levitt or j just, it just feels like it thinks it's a bit more clever than it actually is. It's not that clever. It's interesting, but, um, and then it goes a, a different direction. Uh, Julianne Moore is, is is in this film as well. I, I thought it was good. I thought it was really good. I really liked the direction and the editing. Um, uh, Josh Gordon Levitt puts on quite an accent for this film, and I feel like every time he narrated the film, which was you know fairly you know frequent increments throughout the film, the narration was always a, a bit more of a thicker accent than what he actually used in the film. I feel like it didn't match up and was a bit jarring. Um, but I like the way the repetition that was used in this, you know, displaying daily routines and that kind of thing. I thought, you know, he put, did a good job putting the film together. Um, wasn't too impressed with how Julianne Moore's character panned out. Didn't really buy that too much. But I did like the way it ended. And overall, it was um, it was good. I enjoyed it a lot. But um, not as great as I thought it would be, and not as kind of cool and original as I think some people have said it is. Um, next is Francis Ha. The 2013 film by Noah Baumbach, Bach. Um, and all I know about him is that he co-wrote two of Wes Anderson's movies. Um, I want to say The Life Aquatic and Fantastic Mr. Fox. And it definitely feels a bit like a Wes Anderson film. There's this kind of feel of the uh, French New Wave to this film, and it's about a girl called Frances, living in New York. You know, late twenties, just hasn't really got a real plan in her life and just kind of drifting and if you if you I think the actress's name is Greta Gerwig if you like her performance in this film you'll like the film if you don't you're not gonna like the film because it is all about her and it's very kind of naturalistic and awkward I found it very funny and I really enjoyed the way it was shot and it's in black and white and uh, I really really like this film I gave it like a 9 out of 10 when I was rating it but I could totally see how people would not like this film at all. You really gotta just kind of enjoy the character and enjoy hanging out with the character and experiencing her life and her un unsure unsuredness of everything. And it's really about her relationship with her best friend and how that kind of changes when her best friend has got a significant other. Um, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was great. Next, Fruitvale Station, 2013. Also, stars Michael B. Jordan, who's fast becoming you know quite a Hot, hot young actor um, in the in the business. I saw him in Chronicle last year. I thought he was fantastic in this. And I thought he was great in this movie too. Um, as Absolute Sublime One Jay also said, uh, this movie felt a bit overrated to me. People were saying, you know, Oscar you know, nominated. This is going to be you know, it's going to be like huge, great performances and everything. And yeah, I thought there was some good performances. It was based on a true story, a very horrible true story about this guy called Oscar Grant. I want to say, definitely Oscar anyway. And he got shot by a policeman on New Year's. Um, on New Year's Day, early in the morning, 2009, I think, um, and yeah, and he died. And it's you see the, uh, the clip of the actual shooting, uh, or the cuts out just before the gunshot at the beginning of the movie. I didn't know it was a true story, and so we see the final day of Oscar in this film. And I thought Michael B. Jordan was fantastic, but overall, I felt like the story, as a film, didn't really, you know, it, it didn't really. I, 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 when it was finished, I didn't feel like I got anything out of it other than this is something terrible that happened to someone. I don't feel like it raised awareness for anything. I, I just, yeah, I, it was really good. You know, the promises and everything and the way it was shot. Um, well, I wouldn't say the direction was amazing, but, you know, it was nicely put together and everything. And I just, at the end of it, I just kind of felt like, you know, it wasn't as kind of earth-moving, as, as groundbreaking as I thought it was going to be based on the reviews and the buzz around the film. Now I need to scroll down. 
to get to the final list. Um, Spy Hard, I watched this over my dad's while I was um, staying over with my little brother Tommy, who's um, eight now. Put Spy Hard on, and I, I think I watched that when I was around his age with my grampy, my late grampy, and um, I love Spy Hard. It's just um, basically it's um, it's a spy movie in the Naked Gun. Uh, you know, realm. I guess you could say it's Leslie Nielsen playing this uh, special agent, and um, it's just complete farce. You know, it's a, it's brilliant. Loads of cameos and just ridiculous stuff going on. Just a fun movie, you know. And especially the theme song is probably the highlight of it. You know, <laughs> especially towards the end. I think the not towards the end. The ending credits is the same song, but it's tailored to the fact that it's the end of the movie. It's like <laughs> I think it's Weird Al Yankovic who does it. And one of the lyrics is like. Uh, this is the end of Spy Hard, you know. Um, it's funny. I'm not doing it justice because I'm tired, and <laughs> but it's funny. And if you've seen it, you know what I mean. Next, another 2013 film. Funnily enough, Side Effects. Uh, Steven uh, Soderbergh uh, made this film. This is one of his three films he made before he announced that he was retiring from filmmaking, and then he went back on that and said that he was taking a hiatus. But this was one of the. This was billed in America as like his last theatrical movie because Behind the Candelabra um, was not released in cinemas in America. It was in the UK, but it was just a HBO TV movie in America. So for a while, this was like you know the last cinematic movie by Steven Soderbergh. But of course, he's now said that he will probably come back to directing at some point. Anyway, side effects stars Rooney Mara, and again, two weeks ago, the last Friday film reviews I talked about. Ain't Them Bodies Saints, and I thought she was fantastic in that. Said she was fast becoming one of my favorite favorite actresses um, of of the present, along with Saoirse Ronan, and this solidifies that she was brilliant in this movie. She goes three for three for me. I've seen her in three movies: this, um, Ain't Them Bodies Saints, and The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. I think she's been fantastic in all three films, playing three completely different characters, and I just think she's she's awesome. Um, and she's a woman who's dealing with depression and stuff. Uh, her husband, played by Channing Tatum, has just got out of jail, and she's depressed, and she tries killing herself, and Jude Law is her psychiatrist and tries to help her through it with these antidepressants, which lead to a lot of bad things happening with the side effects. And the way the story goes is really interesting. I like the way it went, and I thought Jude Law was brilliant. I'm, I'm a big fan of Jude Law. Um, I saw recently saw this year Gattaca for the first time, which I think was his first film, and I thought he was amazing in that movie. Really liked him. I used to dismiss him a lot when I was younger, but um, you know, for films like Alfie and stuff. But I think Jude Law, when Jude Law's great, he's awesome, and I really liked him in this movie. Um, Channing Tatum's not in it that much. It's mainly Rooney Mara, um, Jude Law, and Catherine Zeta Jones who plays a more pivotal role in the film as it progresses. And I really liked the way it went. Great movie. Next is Prince Avalanche, uh, again 2013, and I love the idea behind this movie. It was um, it was filmed in secret, took 16 days to shoot, <coughs> very low budget, and it starred Paul Rudd and Emil Hirsch, who are you know pretty big name actors who've been in a lot of in a lot of films. Paul Rudd more so, but um, it's directed by David Gordon Green, who I'm a big fan of. I love a lot of his comedy movies and stuff, and he's done quite a few big budget movies. You know, I think the last one was Your Highness. Um, and he wanted to move away from that and go back to his, his low budget independent route so he did that with this film Prince Avalanche um, which is um, set in the 80s I think just after a huge kind of um, fire had ravaged a, for a forest area and burned down homes and stuff um, and this was filmed in the aftermath of, an, of a real life um, forest fire I, I'm not sure if the one that it's supposed to be set in was a real forest fire or not I think it was, I'm not sure but a real one happened I think, in 2011 and so they filmed this I think in 2012 in the aftermath of that to make it more kind of realistic and there's four characters in the film those two there's an old man who kind of um, he drives down to them because what they're doing is they're just painting lines on the road and rebuilding the road kind of thing just off on their own in, in this kind of burnt out forest um, and there's an old man who drives through and they talk to him and drink with him and stuff and then there's this woman who's kind of just digging through the remains of her house and she's not an actress. She was an actual person who was actually there who had her house burned down and they just included her in the film and I really enjoyed that. It was um, a weird kind of eerie scene and added a lot of kind of heart to the film but it was a weird kind of... It's a strange film. The cinematography is fantastic. I think the acting is incredible but it's very naturalistic and it's very slow 
and the music is incredible. I absolutely love this. There's a great scene where Emil Hirsch, he, he takes the, the truck off into the city for the weekend. Paul Red's left just on his own with their, their, their camp stuff, you know, tent and whatever. And he's just fishing and, you know, just sleeping on a hammock. And he's out there and there's this montage of his weekend and there's like a shot of a, of a turtle kind of walking across the forest and the music and everything. It's just, I really love that scene. It was really dreamy and awesome. Um, and the way it ended, um, you know, there's no no big ending or you know uh, revelation or anything. When when I read up about it, there was a lot of things about it that was like, whoa! I just added a whole other dimension to that movie. And I was looking it up, and then I saw something. And, and there is something you can look at in the film as soon as it starts, and it really informs what many people have been theorizing about the film. I'm not going to spoil it, but just the, the the possibility of it, and it really does kind of match up if you think about it. Um, just added a whole nother level to this movie and I thought it was brilliant, really, really good. Um, and yeah, I was just looking things up online after you watch this movie and make up your own mind. Um, really, really interesting stuff. Next one, The Spectacular Now. We're near the end now. Spectacular Now, another 2013 film. And this is the coming-of-age movie that I think everyone wants to make. Um, they really knocked out of the park with this one. I just thought... Pff, and I forget, I forget the guy's name now, but he directed um, Smashed, another independent film from 2012 starring um, uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead and Aaron Paul, about two alcoholics. I love that movie, I thought it was great. I think I reviewed it actually in one of my Monday Movie Reviews episodes, so you can go and check that out. Really, really good film. This is his next film, The Spectacular Now. It's about um, a teenager. I've forgotten his name now, I've watched so many films lately. And he um, he's really the popular kid, you know. Um, and he has the popular girlfriend, but they've just split up, and so he's trying to win her back and stuff like that. And but he's really the cool kid, and you know, goes out partying, and he's essentially an alcoholic as well. He's a teenage alcoholic, and he bumps into this girl, who is kind of is kind of just flipping the whole kind of high school coming of age movie thing on its head, because the girl is the one who is kind of not really that popular, who is not really that traditionally beautiful, and is not really you know. That confident and has and is inexperienced with relationships you know, as a teenage girl, and so you know he he kind of goes along for the ride with her you know and you know doesn't really like have feelings for her and then things change and then things change again and the alcoholism is kind of brought into it and his kind of relationship with his father and I thought this movie was fantastic it was absolutely just really stellar I just thought the guy was just magnetic although his charisma was awesome I thought the girl was brilliant as well. Great side side characters, performances. I love the way it all panned out, the way it kind of you know ended up, and yeah, it was really. It felt like um, you know you got Kings of Summer this year. You got the Way Way Back. And I love both their movies. Really love both their movies. Um, and I love this movie as well. I think I probably prefer the Way Way Back, but the Spectacular Now, excuse me, the Spectacular Now, is definitely just blows the other chart out of the water when it comes to a coming of age movie because you just feel it just feels realistic it feels authentic it feels like you're actually looking at two teenagers living their life as teenagers and figuring out who they're going to be and there's a you know scene where they you know, have sex for the first time and it was just so realistic and just kind of um, sweet in a way you know and I really appreciated that and uh, yeah great film this spectacular now the, the last film of 2013 I'll be talking about in this video is Behind the Candelabra, another Steven Soderbergh movie that, again, as I mentioned, was released in the cinemas in the UK, but only on TV in America. It stars Michael Douglas as Liberace, and it stars Matt Damon as his much younger lover, um, allegedly from the, um, the 70s until the 80s. And, the, the, you know, Liberace famously, you know, always denied that there was always denied that he was gay and everything even though he clearly was and um, after his death you know this guy who had been with him for many years came out and wrote a book and, and that's what this movie is based on and and we get to see that from their whole relationship and you gotta give Matt Damon and Michael Douglas credit they went they went full, full gay with this movie Michael Douglas was absolutely fantastic I mean he just transformed himself and was just I just totally believed him. I totally bought everything that he did as Liberace, and I just thought it was just one of the best performances of the year, without a shadow of a doubt. You know, Matt Damon was great too, but Michael Douglas just took it to a whole other level, and they were both so committed to the role, you know, full on kissing, and it didn't seem like two straight actors kissing, it seemed like two gay men 
lovingly kissing each other. And I just totally drew me in. You know, there's some great side performances. Um, Rob Lowe was really funny as this um, plastic surgeon. We had uh, Dan Aykroyd playing a lawyer who was really good. I didn't realize it was Dan Aykroyd for quite a while until I recognized him and took a closer look at him. But um, I really, I, I was like 20 minutes in the movie, I was like, I can't believe how much I'm enjoying this. You know, I was only watching it because I heard such good things, and it just didn't seem like my kind of movie with all the, you know, the, the big kind of glamour and glitz and you know the the gayness of it. You know, no offense. You know, just not my kind of thing. Um, but I really, I thought it was brilliant. It was really endearing. It was touching, moving, um, a little heartbreaking at the same time, and frustrating, and yeah, just a, a, a brilliant film. Really, really good. Two more to talk about. One more, really. Um, in fact, I'll skip to the end. Uh, the la latest movie I watched was The World's End again. Um, I watched the Blu-ray, but I watched it with the uh, audio commentary from Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg, so I didn't really watch it, but I watched it again with the commentary and just opened up all so many more kind of things I love about the movie, things I didn't even know that kind of linked it up and just gave me an, an even bigger level of appreciation for how awesome that movie was. And uh, the final movie, although I watched it before The World's End with the audio commentary, was something I watched on Christmas Eve while I was wrapping my presents. Now last year I watched uh, Groundhog Day while wrapping my presents on Christmas Eve. It seemed appropriate. This year I went a little bit different and I went with Total Recall, the Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, movie. Um, do I have the... yep. The awesome Steelbook edition. I, I love the, cover, the, the the artwork on this. And I love the, love the, love the movie. It's, um, if you haven't seen it, I, I'm not going to go into the plot, but I think everyone's seen this movie. Um, what I love about it is that it takes this amazing production design for a science fiction movie that's out both on Earth in the future and on Mars. Some fantastic practical production design, just amazing stuff. Not only the sets and the miniatures, but you know, all the, the special effects and things like that. But how violent it is, how ruthlessly violent it is. Like this scene where Arnold Schwarzenegger uses a guy as a human shield and this guy is just getting leathered with bullets and there's squibs popping off, blood flying everywhere and it's really violent but these days they just do CGI blood, you know, just thing just looks fake and a proper squib, you know, but there's just squibs going off everywhere, it just looks so brutal uh, Paul Verhoeven directed this, obviously um, who did Robocop, you know, Starship Troopers and he really brought his own kind of thing on thing to this. I thought it was great. I thought the concept was great. You know, the the interesting ideas. It's disturbing towards the end. This is uh, I won't even go into it in case you haven't seen it. But uh, just really the disturbing stuff. But it's still got that kind of cheesy Arnie kind of fun to it at the same time. And uh, it's one of my all time favorite science fiction films. I talked about it in my um, top ten sci fi movies video as well. So. It was great to finally watch that again. It had been a while, so that is it. That's it for Friday Film Reviews, um, number five or six or something like that. And oh, I'm out of breath. I'm tired. I'm probably going to go straight to sleep now, but um, I'm glad I got this done. And only 33 minutes, not too bad, considering the first um, video I did, the first Friday Film Reviews, was like over 40 minutes. So thank you for watching. Um, and if you are listening, watching this right now, then well done for getting through it, unless you fell asleep and are just now waking up, in which case, um, just leave it, you didn't, you didn't miss much. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll try and do one next week so I don't have to subject you to another bumper video in two weeks time, and um, Friday Film Reviews should um, resume uh, with normalness <laughs> next Friday, which will be 2014, so we'll be kicking off the new year with another um, instalment of... Uh, Friday film reviews. Thank you for watching. I'm babbling now because I don't know how to finish this. Oh, just looking at that list, there's just so many films I've watched. Um, yeah, thanks for watching. <laughs> Jeez. Thanks for watching, and uh, see you next time. I'm tired, if you can tell. He says he's really cool, but I think he's a tool. <laughs> Even though I'm sure he's a. Uh... Quite nice guy, really. <laughs> He's a quite nice guy, really.